Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Charles Butler. I am also at Lazy Power on IRC, Twitter, all those other great places that you can find me. I am the one true original Lazy Power. And I'm here to talk to you today about some of the key players that we have in uh, the Ubuntu uh, ecosystem for orchestrating clouds. We've got uh, your, your base core Ubuntu server. Uh, we've also got Snappy Core now, which was recently introduced for the Internet of Things and other uh, such as Ubuntu Touch, some great stuff. Uh, we got Mass on the far side, but we're not going to talk about those today. We're going to focus on Juju. Juju is a <laughs> Juju is a service orchestration framework, but it's so much more than that because at its core, it really is an ecosystem. Whenever you buy into Juju, you're buying into a full ecosystem of tools and uh, community members, documentation, and so much more than that. But before I really dive into the different facets of that, let's talk about what the motivation behind Juju was, why it's important, and why you uh. Why we got to this. So in the beginning, there was uh, single servers. You would have somebody typically working in a basement somewhere is the <laughs> stereotype. And you would call them up whenever the email server went down, right? Hey, man, email's down. Or you know, need to rack a new server. It's time to scale. So we started adding to these. We have clusters. And this was still very much manual management. And then there was the invention of virtualization. We discovered that we could slice these machines up get more use out of these servers. By uh, throwing virtualization on top of it, we could manage these, image it. And it was really interesting. But today, we've also got containers. So when you start looking at the full stack and how crazy this is, there's a lot of different moving parts to this. And it gets increasingly complex to work on every different layer of that stack. So let's throw on top of that the complexity of development. You've got this guy who looks and works kind of like that guy. This guy is like nothing like either of those. So we wanted a tool that worked with everything. So once again, what was our original goal? We want to effectively deliver and maintain applications. And by doing that, we're going to split this down into three separate areas. We're going to talk about the development, the deployment, and the ops side of it. So when you start developing your infrastructure, looking at infrastructure as code, you need a method that is consistent. It's going to be, it's going to have high production parity. You want to be able to model your deployments as close to what you're running in production. Otherwise, you're basically testing something that doesn't necessarily represent what you're going to be working with in the wild, and that introduces new variables that you have uh, that are outside of your control. We also need these environments to be shareable. So if you're working on a component and it's got three services attached to it, you need to be able to share that with another developer. And then you need to be able to spin it up with the exact same configuration and get moving with it quickly. We also need these to be readily available amongst our entire team. The onboarding process can be very difficult. It's often time consuming and not very cost effective. So with all of these in mind, we're going to go to the next stage of deployment. So deployment's pretty straightforward. We just want to start and configure some services. And we also want to put our applications there. But then whenever we get to ops, we also need to think about the service life cycle. What is the service? Uh, how are we going to manage that service life cycle? How are we going to reconfigure services as we start introducing new microservices into the, into the stack, into the model? And how are we going to work with the interactions between those services? So Juju has a goal of encapsulating ops knowledge in any environment, whether it's a public or private cloud. And we also want to provide a dynamic infrastructure with interchangeable services. So we've effectively turned your code, infrastructure as code, into interchangeable parts and turned it into like a factory line. And the big win behind this is so that you can focus on being an expert in using your services and not on knowing how to deploy it and how to run the service lifecycle management of those services. Now, we're not saying that you should not read the book and understand how to work with that service. We're just saying that we want to remove that first step. We want this to be approachable. In today's society with startups, your moving from idea to production is going to is going to determine your chances to win. If somebody else can do it faster than you, they're going to get there first. They're going to get the credit. So, <laughs> back at I want to say that it was at ChefConf. One of my personal heroes, Jamie Windsor. I actually come from Camp Chef. He made a statement that resounded with me, with such amazing implications. He stated that nobody's playing Nginx or MySQL. We're playing League of Legends. 
And that to me just, it, it like hit me in the face like a ton of bricks. Because when you really stop and think about it, when you keep focusing on the machines and thinking about those services underneath it, you're looking at one small part of that picture. You need to take a step back and take a look at what you're providing. What is important to you? What are you giving your customers? What is printing your money? What is keeping things moving? You know, what is, what is keeping your community moving? What is your project? And that spoke volumes to me. So we all know that modern architecture is service-centric because we started talking about microservices, containerization, uh, immutable infrastructure. These all buy into that. And we have a model for that called charms. But charms are more than just services. Charms actually encapsulate, uh, I need to take a drink, I'm sorry. <coughs> charms encapsulate ops knowledge, but they also dictate how it's going to work and interface with other services in your stack. While some configuration management tool chains do work with uh, opposing services, and they get into a little more heady things like service discovery and auto discovery, we have de defined a model that makes this a declarative syntax, and this dictates how your application will reconfigure, given in a uh, specific configuration. So not only can you configure a service with like, you know, I know that I want to have 80% of my RAM dedicated to my SQL. We can also state that once we've related it to a slave, that that slave is now going to be a read replica. So we've encapsulated config management as the top level, which is oftentimes where a lot of people get hung up and thinking that, oh, Juju is another configuration management tool. We actually set a layer above in the stack. We're doing orchestration. And the reason that I say that is because we're language independent. We want you to bring the skills that you have with all of your other tools into this rich ecosystem and continue to make it awesome. And you can use whatever tool you're using today, even if that's Bash, if it's Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt Stack. I'm sure that we've got somebody representing a tool that you know, nobody else has really heard that they've kind of worked on themselves. Bring it with you. And on top of that, there's also operational intelligence. Reason being, I started to talk about this and then got a little sidetracked. The relationships, which is the line between MediaWiki and MariaDB, is how, we're, is how we're doing the orchestration. This is how we're dictating things uh, and how the events system works in the environment. So we can change out MariaDB with MySQL if we want to. Now how does that work? What you're looking at here is a is a YAML file, and this is metadata.yaml. This is the one core file that's required to make a Juju charm. Everything else is optional. As long as you have this, you have made a charm. It's not gonna do anything. It's gonna no op whenever you deploy it to your environment, but at least it will understand how to, how to work with it. So it's got a name, summary. You wanna tell us who the maintainer is, so that way in case things break, the uh, user can get back to uh, and talk to the maintainer. Give us a description, because we're gonna display this in something I'll show you a little bit later. We tag it for nice categorization. And then the big important part is right here, where it says requires. This is where we're dictating to Juju what's going to talk to our service. These are the things that I understand. I understand DB, I understand slave, and I understand cache. And what's cool about that is that there's two components to this. Not only do you have the relationship name, you also have what's called an interface. And interfaces are where the magic happens. This is where data is going to be exchanged across the wire. So you can have any number of relationships that share, but as long as they have their own unique interface, that's where you can start stacking different services together using the same relationship and getting that same data across the wire, which enables these interchangeable components. Provides is something that your charm is going to expose to the environment. So if you're deploying a web service and it provides a website relationship, that means that uh, it's going to send over the private address and probably port 80, so that way you can hook it up to a load balancer. So interfaces are loosely typed contracts, meaning that we don't superimpose any kind of an RFC. There's no standardization to it. You are free. This is kind of the Wild West in Juju, where you can get in there and really start to thrive and start defining your applications and how they talk to one another. So given the example, I'm MediaWiki. So I know how to connect to databases that implement MySQL. Then uh, whenever I try to relate this to MongoDB, that's not going to work, right? Because MongoDB does not implement uh, MySQL. So looking at this with the uh, YAML, we see that it requires MySQL. We don't have MySQL anywhere on MongoDB. So this relationship will not work. It does not expose. If you try to do it on the command line, it's going to no-op. Try to do it to the GUI, it's going to complain at you. 
Actually, it won't even let you draw it, but. So we know that this isn't gonna work. Now, whenever we look at MariaDB, we have a requires DB interface MySQL. MariaDB provides interface MySQL. That's a match. It's awesome, it's gonna work. So to touch a little bit more on what I was saying earlier about getting you to market faster, working with your application, getting your ideas in production, uh, Albert Einstein said that you have to learn the rules of the game and then you have to play better than anyone else. And I feel at this point with this declarative model, we've gotten pretty close to that because orchestration really is agility. It allows you to interchange your components and test out ideas and move between these ideas. How many of you have seen Juju deploy OpenStack? Anybody? We've got a couple. Juju is the underlying engine that empowers Ubuntu to deploy OpenStack. You might have seen our autopilot service where literally Mark will bring somebody on stage, say here, please pick out services you want, click start, boom, you have OpenStack. It's a very complex deployment. If you're doing it by hand, it can take you a couple days to a couple weeks to understand the process of what services need to be configured, how they fit together. It really is an operating system for the web. So looking at that, if you were to start deploying OpenStack today, you have all these services to understand and how they're gonna fit together, what information needs to be sent over the wire, how these applications should be configured. You misconfigure one of those components, uh-oh. And this is basically selling on the configuration management side of it. But then whenever we get to the newer services and you wanna start changing things out, it's amazing, Juju enables that. This is a big data stack. This is working with Hortonworks Hadoop and it's hooked into a logging system with uh, that's uh, front-ended by Elasticsearch and Kibana. These are all available and we like to call them executable white paper because we're encapsulating the best of the community's knowledge distilled into these charms. And we distribute them through a charm store uh, that undergoes peer review. And what's beautiful about that is that it's bundle happiness. Bundles define your entire infrastructure in a single file. They can define components or they can define the entirety of your infrastructure. So you're in development. You get all these services together, you deploy it, you ship this off to staging. Redeploy it, run tests against it, things look great. You go to production, same thing. High production parity, it's happiness across the board. So in this model, development and ops really work together. Developers get to deploy applications, they have production parity, and ops get the opportunity to define the core infrastructure that your developers are gonna work on. They can also audit anything that's coming in for security, and they can also operate at scale. And developers are then allowed to ship the fragments of their infrastructure so ops can do their review. So looking at this from a business standpoint, developers get to work with only their concerns, and ops get the ability to modify the entire bundle, and they can move services between clouds quickly. So if we look at how this is decomposed, in a typical environment, you might have your physical layer, your infrastructure as a service, which is either just some core Ubuntu servers or OpenStack. And then above that, you can delegate the concerns with the VMs and the containers are where the devs get to play and work with their, uh, their side of the infrastructure. And this separation of concerns really helps it to move at the speed of thought because with this decomposed infrastructure, you've got your core service with your uptime. And then developers are now free to experiment and work and move amongst the different containers and VMs. So you might be asking where you can use Juju. We're in every public cloud that is listed here. We've got Amazon Web Services, Joint, HP, uh, Windows Azure, Google Compute Engine, and DigitalOcean. There's a couple that I haven't mentioned because using the manual provider, you can use any cloud, whether that's public or private. You lose a little bit of the magic, which is enlistment. Or if you're using Ubuntu Mass, you can even orchestrate with bare metal. So if you've got spare servers laying around, you can just slap those together, start deploying today. So let's talk about the tooling that we have to facilitate your creativity. The Juju GUI is arguably the best component here because I like to call it manager mode, but really it's introspection mode. This is how you can visualize everything you're working with in your environment in one go. Each and every one of these charms represents a service that you have deployed and you can see all the relationships between the different services. So if you were to take vacation and somebody were to come in and say, hey, what's going on? There's a red line here between my Zabbix agent and Dashing. It means that there's an error that's going on with the configuration management. You pushed a change that was not good. There's also Juju Quick Start. 
which is going to help you get up and moving quickly. It's going to bootstrap an environment, deploy the Juju GUI to it, and expose it for you. But this is the thing that gets me excited. The Juju Charm Store is the collection of all of the Charmer recommended charms. This is including our OpenStack charms, our Big Data charms, uh, Apache. These charms have run the gambit, typically started by community members, submitted through code review process, and with an iterative process, they, we've gone through, we've added tests, we have run testing deployments on every single cloud. All of these charms are now under CI. So these are certified to work in your infrastructure and the cloud. <coughs> and you're getting the benefit of everybody that has used these charms and can contribute it back. If I were to give it a label, I would say it's a lot like a forge. But this forge is, is open for everybody, and every one of these charms is licensed with OSI approved licensing. Now, some of them may have MIT and Apache license. Some of them are GPL3. That's up to the author of the component. The, that's the only requirement that we have is that they have tests and that it's an OSI approved license. So, if you have any questions about what I just ran through really quick like, I will put my slides up online. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at @lazypower, and that's where I'll be putting those. Or you can join us on irc.freenode.net and pound juju, or you can reach out over the mailing list. Now, I had made mention in the last talk that I was going to run a quick experiment using some sentiment analysis. So I invite you to tweet at the FOSDEM15 hashtag. And let me be the first one to say that this is kind of a toy. This is running sentiment analysis. And we will look at how this is put together and deployed with Juju. Uh, I was going to try to redeploy this live on stage, but since I don't have SSH access, that's not going to work. But what's going on is that this application is trolling Twitter. And every time that we get a new tweet that comes in with the hashtag uh, FOSDEM15, it's going to split that up. It's going to pull out the common words and of the, and it's going to run the remaining letters, or rather words, through a sentiment analysis wizard. So if you were to tweet something like FOSDEM15, this is awesome. Look at lazy power on stage. Self plug. Woo -woo. And at that point, it's going to run through. It's going to say, hey, it's got the word awesome. And it's going to rank it. It's going to give it a score. And you'll see the green, uh, the green gauge go up. And there will be some uh, <laughs> false positives, seriously. And that will cause the red to go up. That's why I say don't use this as like legitimate. This is the science behind sentiment analysis. No, this is like the most basic thing that I could put together before uh, the demo. So looking at this, I'm going to leave this up for a little bit. And I'm going to invite you to ask questions before we dive back into the GUI and take a look at a deployment environment and what we can introspect with it. Are there any questions? Now that's, I'm really glad that you asked that. Uh, that's part of the key to building a rich environment is defining proper relationships and interfaces. So as long as the same information is required, let's say that you're using log stash agent on one machine, but you can also use HECA to ship those logs with its log shipping agent. Now as long as it's requiring the same information, just an IP address and maybe a port to send that data to, at that point you're good to go. If you have multiple instances, you can define that as being a leader, or if you're going to run into a, into a situation that requires a quorum, you can run a lection inside of the charm code and determine a leader. So that way it sends consistent information back over the wire. There are patterns that we have in libraries that we're developing to help with this. Now, some of it is a little, little iffy, I'll be honest. Okay. Which website is going to run its query? OK, so you're using two, two separate MySQL servers, and you've related to one of the two uh, MySQL servers, correct? OK, at that point, it's going to run queries against the one database that it's got a relationship with. If you define a relationship between that database and the secondary database, depends on how the charm is going to react. If the charm has already been configured, and then it receives that relationship data a second time, it's going to silently drop it, and it's still going to be running those queries against the first database. Now, what I would suggest and recommend is that you actually set that up as a read replica and just scale a single database cluster, uh, unless you have need for a secondary. Now, we've given you enough power to do what you need to do to be creative, but we've also given you enough power to shoot yourself in the foot. So use it like pseudo. You know, experiment with it, understand what's going on, work with the tool, uh, but you do have power to create catastrophic events. So uh, use a moderation. Any other questions? I see one here.
certainly. Uh, whenever you go to deploy a service, you have an opportunity. Now, I would love to do this right now, but like I said, I can't reach out over SSH, so it's, it's kind of limited my ability to do live demos. Uh, but you can pass a TAC TAC2, and you can define KVM colon with the machine ID, or you can provision one on the command line as you're doing that, and it will go into a container or a VM on that machine. So it's gonna assume bare metal by default. If I just say juju deploy WordPress, it's going to deploy WordPress to a bare metal machine or a cloud VM, given the environment. But if I add a TAC TAC2 and say, LXC colon four, it's going to pick machine four, it's gonna create a LXC container, and then it's gonna deploy WordPress inside of that. That is correct. The charm itself just encapsulates the, the knowledge of the application. The environment that it's running in is the concern of the person that's deploying the environment. So um, I'm not gonna say that there's not charms that don't, because we have a few that leverage Docker, and obviously a Docker charm is going to deploy a Docker container into a Docker host. It's not going to attempt to do this out of thin air and just you know, stuff it on the uh, bare metal. It's gonna try to fetch Docker, install it, pull the image down, and get it running. That is correct. Okay, Juju is an event-driven system. So as you, as you deploy something to the GUI, it's gonna go through a couple different states. The first state that's gonna arrive at is called install. And at that point, you would do all of your pre-configuration management stuff, like if you have dependencies you need to install, like Git, maybe you're doing a Git-based delivery platform. And after that, it's gonna run into a configuration change hook. Now, with these events happening in sequence, they're going to queue. So say that you relate something while it's deploying. Once it's reached its start hook, it's going to go into the relationship change hook. So it would be really nice if my laptop didn't decide it was ready to go to sleep. Um, so with that in mind, let me actually pull a charm up. And let's actually dissect one. Oh my goodness, if I could type. Uh, let's pull up. Actually, let's pull up the Docker charm. I like this one because we've got a lot of Ansible in here. So I'm going to tree the hooks directory, and what you see in here are all the different hooks that we have implemented for, for the Docker service. Uh, the way that these are gonna work in sequence is that it's gonna go through an install hook, which is where you do all the pre-install uh, business. The config changed hook, which if you expose configuration options for your charm, these are gonna run every time that a user changes those. So say, for example, I were to say juju set docker latest equals true which is going to install Docker from the upstream host. Right now it's trying to communicate over SSH, so quit that. And you define these configuration options for your service in a straightforward YAML format. You've got a, a, a parent key of options, then after that you just start listing them out. We support three present option types at present. These are kind of limiting, we're aware of this, and we're actually working to add more, such as static lists, so that you can kind of define and scope what your users have the ability to choose. Uh, but there's string, boolean, and numeric values. Uh, and working with these in the charm code, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, let me actually open this up into a hooks.py. Can everybody see that too? I realize that I'm working on what I can see, maybe not what you can see. Is that better? Okay. Um, this is actually a Python wrapper in Juju. So as I said, you can, it's language independent. You can bring whatever experience you have with you. And we chose to do a, a little bit of uh, Python shenanigans to make Ansible play really nice with Juju. And in order to work with that, we've got uh, this library called Charm Helpers. And Charm Helpers is going to bring in a few different niceties for people that are developing charms. It's gonna automatically install Ansible for you. It's also going to uh, set up the PPA and use the latest edition. <laughs> um, we defined some hook names that we are going to uh, expose. So if you implement a hook name that is not in this, it's not going to get run, which is a nice way for us to kind of validate what's coming in. And looking at this, we define a playbook path, and then we also set default hooks for what we're gonna pass in. So these are what it's gonna understand, and this is what it's going to have the ability to run. So you can implement your playbooks, whatever you need to do on the host, and you still have all the Ansible goodness available to you, and Juju is still gonna perform your orchestration for you. So looking at this right here, we've got a decorator for hook install and upgrade charm. This is where we actually run the magic of installing Ansible, and it's got a shebang at the bottom just to run it. So not really exciting, but this is the kind of glue that we're using to make this charm compelling. 
So now, whenever I see it in my playbooks, we've adopted a pattern of trying to keep our concerns in our playbooks nice and encapsulated. So whenever we run install or upgrade, there's only a couple things that we care about whenever this, this state occurs. We want to make sure that we've got a Docker group on the host, because Lexi Docker and the Docker.io package both require this. And we also want to add the user Ubuntu to the Docker group. So if you're familiar with Ansible, this is very straightforward. And this is actually an older copy of this charm. Um, but also at this point, we want to understand what's going on in the environment. We want to find out if docker.io is installed. We register those, and we have those variables available to us further down the call stack. Now at this point, these are all event-driven, so you've got to think about how you're writing your charms in the sequence of, I have an event that's coming in. I have, def I have defined a desired state change to my environment. Now what actions are, are, is it going to take to reach that desired point? And I hope I have got the tests in here. Aha, I do. So we expose a really cool tool, tool chain to do this called uh, Amulet. And Amulet is our testing framework. So I, I'm switching feet on you just a little bit, so bear with me. Um, this has got a unit test style syntax, got a lot of sugar. And the setup is where we go through and we actually deploy units to our our system. So uh, we heard a little bit before about server spec. And what is important to note whenever we're testing infrastructure-based changes? We don't want to necessarily test inside the charm, because that's going to be a unit-style test. For integration tests, we just want to make sure that the environment, we've declared a state change. We want to run an assertion that that state change has occurred. So we say that we're going to give it some time to wait, because we'll run this on every different cloud provider. Uh, at this point, if it hasn't slid up, we'll raise a an error message, and then we actually go down into testing that Docker was installed. So for testing the Docker stat, we make sure that the file is there, USR bin Docker. If it's not, it raises an exception. We want to make sure that we can return info from the running Docker environment. We also want to actually install an image and run it inside of Docker. So we're pulling the BusyBox image, and at that point, we run a couple of different assertions, making sure that we can actually run Hello World through that, and we get that output back. And then if not, it just says that we can't delete the container, uh, the test fails, and at that point, the merge wouldn't be uh, approved. So one of the things that I alluded to that I may not have called out is that we're actually at Canonical running all of these charms in CI against all of the major cloud providers. So you get that for free by buying into our, uh, buying into our system. If you want to get your charms in the charm store, they're going to go underneath our CI, and we're going to take the legwork to making sure that those remain a high-quality experience for everybody that wants to use these. Uh, any further questions? Sure. When you say this is under the playbook, so is it true that it has been universe installed? Universe installed, yes. Yeah. Um, since you're able to work with multiple different data management systems, and you can do it for other own variable systems, do you have some overarching metadata? The config.yaml that I showed is actually exposed on the host as, a, as an API-driven command. You've got config get which will then allow you to pull in the information that you've set in the configuration.yaml. So if you need to hold, warehouse something outside of your config management and then call it in there, that would be the method to do that, is to find it in the config.yaml and then just pull that back in. Or if it's information that's going to be provided by a relationship. So you can define something in config.yaml as a variable and then use that in multiple other mm -hmm. that is correct. buckets and so on. That is correct. So it, it crosses all those different barriers. The, we've actually got a few charms that implement both Bash and Python, just the pure languages, and we see those being intermixed. And that's where a lot of people are getting their start is uh, some of the users that started working with Juju were only familiar with provisioning machines with Bash, and we didn't want to superimpose a limitation of, hey, you have to learn Ruby, or you have to understand a DSL. We wanted people to get moving quickly with the system, and we wanted to get out of their way. And this was one of the ways that we were able to do that, was by exposing this language independence and just giving the orchestration glue to kind of fit these components together. Any other questions? Sure. You could. And I'm going to go a step further with this and state that in the Juju model, you're buying into the Juju state server. This is a client server application. We do have an agent that gets installed. It's all written in Go. It's, it's hyper lightweight. But if you're going to use something like Chef Server, don't use Juju. 
or move to using Chef Solo and use Juju. So you don't want to have two units that are going to define state on a given machine and then have them fighting over one another once a change occurs. Because I have seen this. I actually played this game. It's cool to look at at first until the logs blow up and Nagios gets really mad at you. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's just one caveat that you definitely need to be made aware of that if you do want to buy into this or, or work with it, it's perfectly fine to isolate the environments and have them work with one another, but don't try to have one machine provisioned underneath both because you're going to run into problems with race conditions. Any other questions? No? What's going on with sentiment analysis? Anything positive? Hey, we got a 4.3 on the positive scale. Right on. Sure. You can. Uh, the question was, uh, we have an OpenStack bundle, and he wanted to know if he could move between the different I uh, OpenStack distributions, correct, like Icehouse, Havana, et cetera. You can. Uh, the evolution of the OpenStack bundles is versioned. So in order for you to go from, say, Icehouse, or from Havana to Icehouse, is you would need to find the bundle revision that actually deployed Havana. Now, this is going to be an evolutionary process with the bundles that we provide, because these are going to be the best practice deployments of getting everything all at once. So now you feel free to take these and hack them up and change them. But uh, if I remember correctly, actually, there is a cool tool at jujucharms.com. If you click on demo, you're going to get a disconnected GUI that you can then interface with and start piecing together different components of your infrastructure. So looking at Glance, I do believe that Glance exposes a distribution uh, string. So I'm going to double check that. All right. It looks like I am incorrect in this. But I tell you what I can do, because I'm almost positive that you can do this. I, I, I feel like I'm just pulling a blank. I can get a hold of one of our OpenStack developers and make sure that that is the case, that you can move between them. Um, hit me up at, at LazyPower on Twitter or uh, catch up with me on IRC. Ah, common misconception. We've actually got support landing thanks to cloud-based solutions. Uh, we're going to start deploying. We've already started deploying Windows with Mass. Juju is now coming to orchestrating Windows as well. Uh, we've got a community member that's working on porting this to CentOS. The only thing that's required to actually interface with Juju, the core client, is you have to have cloud in it and a passwordless pseudo user. Those are the two things that it makes assumptions on. Outside of that, the charms now are going to be the impediment if you want to take the existing charms and move it from a Debian-based to an RPM-based system. Uh, so most of those, well, I say most, let's just make the broad statement of all of them are, since right now they're geared towards uh, orchestrating Ubuntu. But there's nothing stopping you from taking these charms and actually making them work with your RPM-based distro. Yeah? That is planned. I, I want to say that it's on this upcoming sprint. But I, I hesitate to give you that as a hard ETA. But it is definitely on the roadmap. Now, as far as monitoring, we have charms that expose that. But we want to bring some more of that logic back into core and get some of that so the way it's integrated into the GUI. Because uh, it is kind of a bummer to say, hey, I've just deployed 50 machines with Juju. It's awesome. And then you've got to go to Nagios and look at all these 50 machines instead of having a nice little health check of like, hey, everything is cool. We've got reachability checks. Everything's pinging fine. Um, but what's interesting is that the charms are going to encapsulate what is going to be the service or the health of your service. So you're going to have a hook that's going to run every so often that'll actually check the state of the machine and the environment and run reports on that as well. I'm sorry? That's hard for me to say. I think that the first step is just to get it reporting. And then after that, if we want to add more logic to that, such as auto scaling, that that's certainly in the realm of possibility. But it's not something that we've necessarily got on the roadmap today. Okay. Um, the correct. Uh, the the changes that you make, you're going to want to export as a YAML file because that's going to be the, the the perfect key to your your deployment environment for every change that you make, whether that's configuration change or upgrading a version. And that's what you would VCS is the bundle of your environment. Now the GUI is very much a first class citizen. 
because it's communicating directly with the state server. The state server is writing this all back to MongoDB, and MongoDB is actually managing those. And we've got a semi-transactional state right now using the GUI. We don't have it to where you can roll back, but you can stage changes before you commit it. So pure transactions are coming. I want to say that it's going to be at the end of this, uh, this cycle, but it hasn't landed yet. So no hard ETAs on that, sorry. Uh, there's only going to be one version live in your environment, but as the bundle itself uh, iterates in the store, as those services get upgraded, those are going to be options available to you in the GUI environment or on the command line that you can then juju upgrade charm, and it'll pull down the latest version. Now, it's not going to override any configuration that you've already specified. It's just going to upgrade in place. So say, for example, uh, with the glibc thing that came out, and say that you've deployed the Ubuntu server charm. So whenever the next one comes out, says, hey, this is available for you to upgrade. You say, juju upgrade Ubuntu. And at that point, it's going to run, pull your AppKit updates, and it's going to patch everything for you. Any other questions? Sure. As far as OS upgrades, we version all of the charms so that way they're tied to a series. And we typically recommend that people use LTS for their deployments. So that's what we've modeled it after. We've got a precise series. We've got a trusty series. And I believe Vivid is the next LTS, and that'll be the next one that you can target at for charms. Uh, you know, I haven't actually had anybody ask that question, so that's a really good one. I know that you would have to deploy the trusty series of the charm, but I don't believe that you can upgrade. Say you've deployed a precise version of WordPress, and then trusty comes out. I believe that you have to deploy the trusty version of the WordPress charm in order to move to the next release. At that point, data migration, that's going to depend on how you have the WordPress charm configured. If you've got something that's working over NFS and you're storing all of your user data, et cetera, there, then you just have to re-relate that to the MySQL charm. At that point, it's going to send the data over. You may have to fudge some of the username and password stuff because that's generated based on the charm ID. But uh, as far as the start of that, once you've already deployed it, with all your, your data is there, you might have to do a little bit of manual work on that, such as the configuration of editing the username and password for the database. But outside of that, should be fine. Storage is something that's also on the roadmap for being implementation. But uh, we have a block storage broker charm that talks with OpenStack-based uh, persistent storage as well as uh, AWS EBS volume. But outside of that, we don't have support. So we're looking to add that into core for the different cloud providers, but not all of them expose that. For example, if you're deploying to DigitalOcean, you don't have that option. The option is with an NFS server or mapping it to some third-party service. So a little tricky there. We're looking at, we've already started to address it with charms. We're also looking at addressing it in core. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Right. I would say that as far as taking your existing infrastructure and working it with Juju, that you would start trans transposing that one service at a time. I know that that's not the greatest answer, and we're already looking at other ways to, to transpose it. That's actually one of the talks I'm going to have at Configuration Management Camp, is how we can address this issue moving forward to kind of crowdsource some of the info with what people would like to do with that. We've explored things such as using like console to start probing and querying since it's got an agent that you can install on your other services and make it aware, so that way Juju can then communicate with that and then talk to those other services. But as it stands today, Juju is only aware of the services that Juju deploys. Uh, if you're going to work with other services, you can use things such as proxy charms. Like there is a uh, AWS S3 plugin to where you can give it ephemeral storage, and it just sends the credentials that you're going to use uh, back over the wire to your application, and it'll consume those. But outside of that, no, there's not really a great story there. Could you repeat that for me? Uh, 
Okay, uh, we don't have auto scaling. That's actually gonna be tied in with our metrics and health reporting that we were talking about coming up this upcoming cycle. Uh, but whenever that does land, the idea behind that is you would deploy an orchestrator charm that can communicate with your environment. And then based on those health checks, it would then make the actions based on things that you've defined. Now, if you take a look at our Cloud Foundry charm, we've got an orchestrator. You actually just deploy one charm to your environment, you pick the version of Cloud Foundry that you want, and it builds your pass for you and then deploys it into your cloud provider. And at that point, it's also gonna take a look at it and it also handles with a reconciler to do any kind of scaling actions that you might need to do on that service. So that's the kind of intelligence that we're looking to bake in. But the question is, does that belong in a charm or does that belong in core? So we're still having the conversation about that and uh, we actually do invite you, if you're interested in that, to join the conversation. Right, right. But it, the thing is that it's, it's gonna vary uh, depending on the person as well as the cloud. So if you've got hard limits that you wanna set as thresholds for your scale, like maybe your pain goes up to five seconds, you don't wanna scale because at that point you know you've got you know, maybe an extra 15, 20 people and then all of a sudden you got a flood comes in and then you've got a, a hard scale of like your, your 30 second response time. So then you're automatically gonna start scaling, right? Because now you've hit the threshold. So where do you define those and where do you want that logic to live? Right. Uh, let's see here, let me dig in my history. All right, let's take a look at the sentiment analysis stack that we actually deployed. I also discovered that you can't connect directly to IP over this Wi-Fi, which was interesting. I'm on FOSDEM. See, man, I, w I wish I would have met you like before I, I took the stage. Like, but that is choice info. Okay. Well, that may be what's going on here, too. All right, come on, GUI. Hey, that worked. So it was IPv6 versus IPv4. Nice call. Nice call. Um, okay, so looking at this terminal, the output of what I get back from Juju status is actually returned in, in machine-readable and human-readable YAML format. Uh, this particular service takes up, I uh, wanna say 12 units, but I think it's closer to nine. Um, and I'm gonna say, all right, this doesn't look the greatest on this resolution, so I'm gonna try to step through this as carefully as I can. Uh, what I did was I, ha I hit the sidebar. There's a, there's a whole slew of keyboard shortcuts. If you hold shift and press the question mark, you can tune the GUI to do interesting things, such as renaming your environment. So if you don't like EU AWS, you can rename this to, I don't know, you know, Fosdem Rocks. <laughs> we'll save that. And then only for this GUI session, this, uh, this is now known as Fosdem Rocks. Uh, so that's kinda cool for like demos and getting stuff out of the way. But this control bar on the side is actually how you're gonna look at your different units. So Kafka is a service that I've, I've got. That what we put together was a Lambda architecture. There's a node app called Kafka Twitter, and what it's doing is it's trolling the Twitter API and pulling all those tweets in, and it's feeding it to Kafka. Kafka is what's, um, uh, is what's responsible for splitting those up and pulling out the, the normal words. And then at which point it's gonna ship that information off to Apache Storm, where it's gonna convert into a Bolt and Spout job and uh, start running the actual sentiment analysis. So the Juju side of this is I can see that I've got one unit of Kafka running. I don't need more than that. It's got no configuration, and it's got several relations available. It's running the, the Juju Zabbix agent, HTTP Zookeeper, and it's also related to the Kafka Twitter. Kafka Twitter is what's delivering the application. So let's take a look at the storm workers. There's several here, so this is a slightly more compelling of a screen. We get to see all the different machines that we've got making this up, but the GUI still retains the representation of just the service that we care about. I click on this, I can see all the information that I've got about it. I've got a public IP address. Nothing is currently exposed, meaning that I can't reach it over the web. It's only available over the private IP address, so it's still behind the firewall. And it's gonna give me the listing of the relations. Uh, 
Let me see what else is important about this. The configuration, there's no configuration. Uh, we also have what's called a machine view, which allows you to do direct placement, such as you were asking before about how you would deploy to a specific machine, and I offered TAC-TAC-2. The GUI also offers this using uh, using this view right here. So, for example, if I click on Unit 24, and hang on, I need to call shenanigans on AWS. Uh, select and charge search. Here we go. Enable container. Control, click save. Okay, so whenever I click into machines and I come down here to unit 24, which is my Zookeeper unit, I'm gonna click add a container. It's gonna ask me which type I wanna use, if I wanna use Lexi or KVM. I go ahead and provision the Lexi container. And at which point, it is staged. It's got a blue icon next to it telling me that I have staged something. And there's a helpful little message that popped up that says, hey, you've only done something in staging. You need to commit it to your environment before it actually happens. So if I click commit, it's gonna go ahead and say, yeah, we wanna add this here. And now the topology has started adding and provisioning that Lexi container. So back to what I was trying to get to earlier is something with some config. I wanna try to show something that doesn't have my Twitter API credentials, but that, here we go. So the sentiment analysis unit just exposes a port for port 8000. This is a node.js app that's actually receiving the data being emitted by storm. And if I were to change this from 8,000 to say 8080, it would stop the service, reconfigure it. I'm gonna go ahead and break it because we're almost at the end of my talk, so why not? And click confirm. And then at which point, whenever we pull up the sentiment analysis, this iframe should fail to start loading. All right, there we go. It's like, hey, I don't know what to do. Chrome is like, I have got this sick looking page here. I don't know what to do. So it reconfigured itself. It's now running on port 8080. Storm is gonna be emitting messages to nowhere. I have just introduced a catastrophic problem with my environment. So this is what I'm saying by we expose enough uh, opportunity for you to shoot yourself in the foot, but hopefully you've got something monitoring it, such as Nagios or whatever your system checks are until we get health checks built into Juju. Uh, moving this back to port 8000, this should resolve the problem. Give it a couple seconds. Oh, I may have broke it. <coughs> and I didn't. I was hoping. <coughs> all right, so if there's no further questions, this is literally all that I've got. I don't have the time to run through a full deployment because it'll take anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes just to get started. So uh, are there any further questions regarding Juju? No? Okay, my slides are gonna go online as at Lazy Power on Twitter, and I will be running workshops at uh, Configuration Management Camp in Ghent, so make sure you stop by the Juju Room and come see me. We'll talk about Charming. And thank you.